In this episode of the Rebel Entrepreneur Coaching Series, there are adult themes and swear words. So please be careful. If you're listening to this in your car with your kids in the back seat, maybe listen to a different episode and come back to this one. Adult content is coming up. Results, results, results. In business, they tell you it's all about the results, but it's the daily work that leads to the results. And you can't actually control what happens because that's the fascinating bit. Sometimes you do all the right things. Sometimes you do all the work and it doesn't work. Sometimes you do all the right things and you do all the right work and it works spectacularly. You can't control the results, but you can control your daily activity. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Jamie, welcome back to the show. The episode is entitled Results, Results, Results. And well, it's the day after Results Day, isn't it? Uh, yeah, indeed it is. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? I think you have a lot to report back. I feel like I should just go mute and let you talk. Tell us what happened. Oh my God. It's like, so I can't believe it. My Kickstarter was funded. We all knew this already from last episode. In about 24 hours. I think that was the thing that shocked us both. In like 15 hours. 15, 15 hours. hours. Yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome. Possum. Awesome. And then it, I had, so in Kickstarters, there's often this thing called the dead zone. So I had this huge wave. And of course, that was like mostly friends, family, but that huge wave helped to propel me forward. Uh, you said it was mostly friends and family. Didn't we discuss in a previous episode, it was about 50-50. Did we discuss that? Or I don't know if we- Number that, of maybe. backers versus, uh, I think you looked down the list of backers and worked out it was about 50% uh -huh. new, 50% family. I just, I think it's always worth challenging that one that it's all friends and family that love you. Okay, well, you we're, did we're, a good job. we'll look at the numbers <laughs> later. Yeah. But certainly, you know, you do want to lean on your network, right? The people who like already love and support you. So there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And so there was that dead zone. I was still getting like one backer a day, just a random person here and there. And because I got a Projects We Love, like even before I launched, I would show up in people's feed. And when you're doing well in Kickstarter, the the algorithm pushes you forward. It sort of like builds on itself. So that happened. <laughs> and then I heard that there's always a wave at the end, but I'm like, oh, I've done all my marketing. I think all the friends and family I have are, are done. But then like we're starting to approach the end and I am like literally the last two days and I am starting to get like more and more. And I'm like, oh, weird. And it was like Monday and I'm at 5,000. And my, one of my friends is like, ooh, are you going to hit your next stretch goal, which is 5,500? I'm like, no, no, no. You know, like, you're so cute, but no, definitely not. <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> so, because I saw it going up, up, up. And then the woman who made me a Projects We Love contacts me on like the last 12 hours of my campaign. She's like, oh, you're the featured project. I put you as the featured project in comics and illustration. I hope that's a nice push for, for your last, you know, <laughs> The day and I'm like, oh my God, you're making me cry. And she said, you're making me cry. So it was just great. And I think that really propelled me forward. Even actually it did and it didn't because I was like, I, I thought like there'd be just tons and tons of people pledging, but by kind of uh, a ton of them didn't come from that. I think honestly it came from, there is this like psychological thing, you know, where some people like to jump on something, some people like to get on at the end. So on my social media every day. I was like, last three days, last two days, last 24 hours. And people absolutely were coming from my social media to, to do it. And then I'm part of this like private Facebook group about like from that podcast that I'm always talking about. And I like bought their course. I know we said we wouldn't spend money on this, but I'm sorry I did. And a lot of people, I said, oh my God, this is so exciting. I'm, I'm the featured project. And then a bunch of people joined from there. And so it just, cause they also, we all support each other in that group. And it just was so great. And then I'm like, oh my God, I'm at 5,500. Oh, what the fuck? And I just counted down last night until the end. And I was like, this is amazing. So I hit the next stretch goal. I hit three stretch goals and I spaced them pretty far apart. So uh, it's really amazing. I thought that I wouldn't even get funded, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
It's amazing. <laughs> I feel really happy. I just want to say, because everyone's listening, like, well, fine for you, Jamie. Um, you've got all these friends and family. You know, you were talking about doing the work. And I remember last year, was it last year? Not COVID year, the year before COVID year. There's a before COVID and an after COVID. So the year before COVID year, I remember working really hard on my art and nothing was working and I wasn't getting contracts and I wasn't sure. And, and, you know, I'm like, I guess I'll just stick with my day job. Like I felt, I really remember saying to myself, it doesn't matter how hard you work. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. So I just want to say that so people know that it's not like I just had this fluke where, you know, I just happened to have this magical like Kickstarter happen. Like I've worked at a lot of my art in my life a lot and had very, very little success. And I remember literally saying to myself, you can put all the work in and like, it still doesn't mean that you're going to achieve anything. But this time it did. And I feel fucking amazing. It's like, it was just really good timing. I don't know. I feel great. I'm going to stop talking. Ask me questions. Go. Well, I think you are so right. Behind every overnight success is at least 10 years of work. And it's not like you haven't been working on your art for a long time. I don't think the listeners to this show will feel like it's an overnight success. If you're listening to this and you've been listening since episode one with Jamie, I don't know if you remember, but it was you, myself and KC, one of the other pop-up trainers. And we were trying to decide where even to focus. And episode two, we changed focus completely and everything changed. I remember this very well. And I was going to text you how hilarious it is that like (laughs) in that first episode, I was almost going to do stupid KDP books, you know, I'm I'm stupid. I don't know. I'm being a jerk to KDP, but I was going to do this thing, you know, just the KDP books and see if that would work. No, no, no. My own art. Oh, and I almost did a Kickstarter for someone else. Yes. Yeah. I was almost like, well, there's this kid's book author. And I think I am going to still help her do hers, but I'll make her do all the marketing, (laughs) but I was going to do hers. I was going to do hers first and be like, and when I, learn from her maybe then i'll do my own what the fuck (laughs) i almost did someone else's kickstarter i'm so fucking dumb i'm so dumb but i'm not because i didn't thank you i can't believe it yeah that i got you know convinced to do my own project i remember even saying something along the lines of can i give myself this gift (laughs) of working on my own project can i do that (laughs) and uh yeah Absolutely 100%. I would not have done this Kickstarter if it hadn't been for this podcast, Alan. So yeah, there's no question. I would have done someone else's project. I would have maybe changed ideas again. You know, oh, so many things, so many things. Even remember at the beginning, like at the beginning, I wasn't even sure which of my comics to do. And then I just picked one. And the fears I had of that, you know, it might be, is this a good first project? Is this what I want to say for myself? Some of those fears came true. I'll explain. Like, I found a couple of people in that comics group, that private comic uh, Kickstarter group said, oh, I was watching this campaign, but I thought it would just be like a gratuitous sex comic. But the fact that you're like a girl doing it, and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm like, the like it's the opposite of that. I'm like playing on tropes, and I'm super supportive of sex workers, and then they backed it. <laughs> so I'm like, if they thought that, other people must have thought that too. But then other people were like, got it. You know, other people got it and, and understood that I was making fun, not making fun of sex workers, but making fun of like the tropes that a sex worker robot would just be docile and, and not have sort of an attitude of her own. Anyways, so I was correct, but... Shit, that doesn't matter. I did it anyway. I launched, made some mistakes, and uh, yeah, I'm going to stop talking now. Sorry. Just so excited. So two thoughts for me and then a question. The first thought is you've avoided doing the mistake I made at the start, which was I had so many ideas. I would do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other, and I would never push any over the line. You know, I'd have a little bit of success and then I'd go and try something else and try something else. And if you do that, if you constantly dabble in different things, you never finish one project. You never push it over the line. And the magic is in the last 10 feet. It's in that last little bit. Well, I I believe I was thoroughly shamed by uh, Simon to never do that. (laughs) (laughs) So that would be the reason for that. It's only because we've done that many times. That's the only reason. The only reason Rebel Business School is now where it is, is because every year we re-decide to commit to it. And we've done that for nine years and nine years we've been growing it and it's made progress. Whereas all of the other ideas I'd try for a month, go, oh, that didn't work, try something else. And I'd never make progress. So that is amazing that you've done that. And on your second point about the people, I think quite often we as entrepreneurs worry about trying to win every customer and 
what happens is if you try to win every customer, you end up winning none. The people who will get you will be the people who will get you. The people who are confused, well, they are the confused. We will leave them confused. They will remain confused. We're not going to change that. We just need to find the people that love what you do. And if they get it, they'll dive in and they'll be part of it. And I think that thing of I must pick the project that appeases the widest audience or pleases the widest audience is actually the opposite of what the successful strategy will be at the start. The successful strategy at the start is pick the thing that only a small amount of people will get and then throw all in, like go all out. And there'll be a bunch of people that say, I don't get it and won't back it. And that's good because we can move on quickly and find the people that are right. But I think that's natural. I've done it. When I first sold training, people would ask, so Alan, who's your training for? And I would go, anyone? And then they wouldn't know how to help me. Whereas at least you went, this is exactly what my comic is. This is what it's about. This is who it's for. We changed the audience a little bit along the way, but what a journey. So look, having that nostalgic look back through the first few episodes, what do you think the biggest learnings are you've got through this process? Because this is going to help all of us. Like, what have you learned? What have you taken out? What are the key points? Well, yeah, number one, commit to one idea. It doesn't matter what it is, just do it. Number two, if you're going to commit to one idea, it might as well be one that you like. So I went ahead, instead of doing something for someone else or one project that I thought would you know, make more money than the one I'm working on, even if it was my own idea, I chose the one I wanted to do the most. And I think that is probably what gave me all the like motivation and, and drive and joy to do it. And then I'll say, well, there's so many learning lessons, but the third one on the marketing side of things, like I did this just every day. I thought, okay, what do I not feel like doing right now? That is probably what I'm supposed to be doing. So at the beginning, you had me writing all of my followers on Instagram, you know, and I only have 500, but when you're writing an individual message to them, even if it's like a copy paste with a few things changed, it's fucking long. And I did not mm-hmm. feel like doing it. I did not. And then we stopped at the end and end. Because it was like, okay, mentally, like, this is your first Kickstarter, you need a break, do something else. It was a lot of work. But like, I don't know, I'd say like one out of 20 people definitely replied. And even I'll say, even yesterday, on the last day, this one woman who I wrote way, way, way back at the beginning on Instagram, like she had written me saying, Oh, sorry, I missed this message. I just had a baby. I'm like, Oh, no worries. Congratulations on your baby. (laughs) And I was like, this woman's never gonna write me again. And then yesterday, she's like, I just backed your project. So you never fucking know, you know, it's worth contacting people. And I'm really, I feel like this is the only thing I have control over is like contacting individual people. Cause like social media seems like this big thing. It's very scary. It's all out there. You know, you don't know who's really following you. You don't know what the algorithm's doing. The only thing I really have control of is like how many individual people I'm writing. So it kind of did, I think it, it had a big help definitely. And then I actually wrote every single backer. So I have 172 backers and I wrote every single one. I wrote every single one. At first I was just writing, Hey, I'm super excited for you to get my comic. Thank you so much. And then I was like, you know what? No, I said something like, I wish I knew where they were coming from. And you said, well, why don't you ask them? <laughs> <laughs> so I did. So I started saying, Hey, you know, thanks for supporting it. I'm really excited for you to read my comic. Can you do me a quick favor and let me know you know, how you found me. I think it's it's really fun to know. And if you have any questions, let me know. And, you know, hardly anyone responded, but a lot of them did. A lot did. Like I would say, I don't know, like 20 people. I definitely made some friends by doing that. Some back and forth happened that, that led to, to bigger conversations. I found that the algorithm was giving me a lot of people. Some people do things like they just browse Canadian comics and they said they found me that way. Mm. Some people found me because I had done a, a recommendation kind of swap with another comic. Yeah. So no one said social media, but like, it, so it was really interesting to, to to sort of hear where, where people are coming from. And I'm definitely going to do that again. Honestly, I know it sounds crazy, but if I ever have a thousand person funded Kickstarter, I'm still going to write everyone. I don't know if I'll like outsource it to a friend, but I think that it's really important for two reasons. One, it's just, I just want to continue this very personable one-on-one kind of connection with people as much as I can until it becomes too big. And people can drop your Kickstarter. People can actually, I thought they could just go down in funding. No, they can totally unfund. And I lost like three backers during the whole campaign. And each one I'm like, ah, 
why? Um, so I feel that by writing everyone individually and sort of starting a relationship with them, you know, and showing them that I'm not just like, you know, I've just got a Kickstarter and I'm just want whoever to back it. I find that it helps. I, I don't know. I don't have the numbers on this, but I think it helps keep them because if you were thinking of taking your, your pledge away, but someone said hi to you personally and said your name, I think it would just make you think a bit twice before you, uh, you unpledge your amount. So that's just my thought on that. Yeah. It's really interesting. You said about the, you've lost the three backers and the pain. I started my own blog uh, a couple of years ago and I've started a mailing list and been gradually building it up. And it's up to about, I know, I think it's up to about 1500 people on my mailing list was amazing. Then I launched season two of my podcast and like shared that to my mailing list and about 15 people unsubscribed. And uh, like, that was painful. I'm thinking, like, why did you join my list? Did you join it? Who knows? Oh, they've gone. I don't even email people that much. Maybe that's why they're like, oh, who the f is this? But it's interesting how those little things can hurt so much sometimes when it's not even someone you particularly know. It's just someone, and it might be something like they've removed their backing because they've had a bad month at work, they lost their job, they can't spend the money. Who knows what it is? It's probably nothing to do with you. Absolutely nothing to do with you. But it still hurts. And I think one thing for all of us listening is doing business is going to be raw sometimes. <laughs> it's going to have moments of it doesn't go wrong. And I think that's part of the journey. If you don't feel the downs, you'll never feel the highs. And it's sitting through it all. And it like even now, I've been running my own business since 08. So was that 13 years? Uh, it still hurts occasionally. <laughs> it still happens. That's not going to change. Um, but I think the bit for me is, well, if it hurts, you care. And that means that's a good sign for me. It's like, well, I care that people get good value, respond well. Yeah. So Jamie, like, give us the final numbers of the project. What was the final numbers you hit on this? And then I think actually what would be quite useful is let's have a look at the numbers a little bit deeper, because if you've had a successful project, there is stuff we can learn from this successful project that will inform our next project. And I know we've still got to deliver project one, but I still have in mind, what can we learn? What can we apply to the next one? What will be useful going forwards? And yeah, that's what I want to know because marketing is test and analyze, test and check, test and know what the results are. Yeah. And you love a good Excel sheet. So, you know. Oh, give me some data, Jamie. Yeah. Give me some data. <laughs> so the full... Canadian amount that was pledged is 5,579 Canadian. Amazing. That's 223% funded. Wow. And that's at 172 backers. So the average pledge is $32.44. So I had a few big ticket items and those brought it up. And what I found really cool. So at the end, I was getting a lot of $6 people who just wanted the digital comic. That's all that was left. There's like not a lot left about from six and twelve dollars. Yeah, people could have gotten the printed, but I love that because well, it doesn't cost anything <laughs> to me. You know, like yeah. if I just had a fully digitally funded Kickstarter, it would be totally fine. I wouldn't cry, you know. So it for me, like even though those six dollars are bringing down the average sale, like I honestly do not care because if I have three hundred backers and they're all six dollars, but it's all digital, it then I don't have to do it's any all shipping. Profit. It's all yeah. profit. Yeah. And what's cool is I actually do fund a lot of Kickstarters, and you know, because you follow me on Kickstarter, so you're like, why are you doing all these Kickstarters? You're gonna use all your profits. <laughs> but I fund a lot at the low, like five to ten dollar level because I do love to read comics. I, you know, number one. But then for me as a Canadian, yeah, shipping is just so expensive. So, and I, I'm not a minimalist in any sense, but I don't want to have like a million comics like around my house. So it's kind of nice to have these, uh, the digital. So I appreciate people who do it. I do it too. So that's great. Even if it brings down the average pledge, but what's cool is on Kickstarter as a whole, the average pledge is $25. So I'm above the Kickstarter average pledge. So that's very cool. I think for a comic book, that's the bit. Your average pledge is 32 bucks for a comic book. That, like, that's incredible. I know you offered a huge amount more value. And I think that's the general rule in life is you get wealthy by adding value to other people's lives. And some of those ideas, like be killed in the comic, 
uh, be in the comic as this role get these different things like you added a huge amount of value to people's lives and that in general is how you add up those bits and i think the other piece is you can't really tell what the market is going to find value until you put it out there so you put a load of things out there you ask people to buy and then you'll find out very quickly they will tell you which ones they actually want and add value to their life yeah absolutely and i'm really glad i added two more tiers of the be in the comic and looking back like i could have even charged more for those ones so in future when i'm very famous comic artist you know i will definitely up the price of being in the comic. And it's definitely something I'm going to include in every single Kickstarter for sure, for sure, for sure. Even if I had like a finished comic, I would change the comic to add people to it. You know, like mm. it's, it's that valuable, I think. Yes. I think it's a brilliant idea and it's something you can have a lot of fun with. You can have a lot of fun with uh, different roles, different things. Like I have a million ideas. Like someone can be the policeman from the next one. Someone can be this. <laughs> I feel like you should have like X victim number one, X victim number two, X victim number three, or maybe there's a like a scene where everyone gets massacred. <laughs> Would you like to be massacred in my comic book? I don't know. You could have a load of fun with this. People get very dark. There's so many options. I know, I know. And my head is whirring full of these options. It's brilliant. <laughs> Let's get back to, because creativity is a whole other subject. Let's get back to the numbers. Does Kickstarter give you further numbers about traffic? where people have come from. I didn't open the tab, but I do have that Google analytics that I plugged in a while ago, but let's not go so deep into that. But I'll say there's one like direct traffic, no refer. It's weird though, because, okay, so the first one is direct traffic. So obviously that's a link that I pasted to people, but I don't have an email list because the Facebook, so it says 48 pledges came from direct traffic and Facebook did 23. And Facebook mm. is where I feel a lot of friends and family are on. But I wonder if direct, like a Facebook message counts as Facebook, you know, it must. It's still coming from the Facebook site. It would be interesting to find that out. I would ask Kickstarter, yeah. like send them a message and just say, look, I'm really fascinated. I did a huge amount of marketing on Facebook. It's not showing that it's worked. Would Facebook Messenger links show up as Facebook or direct traffic? Because mm -hmm. I just don't know. Because they, the actual web address of Messenger now is Messenger, not Facebook. So I don't know right. whether that would show up as either. And the, there's only one way to know. Yeah, that's true. So I am on my Google Analytics and I don't really understand it all. But it says users 360. But is that just today or always? There should be a date range that you oh, can... Oh, no, that says seven days. Okay, let's say last 90 days. Oh, so I had 1.6K users visit at a 84% bounce rate, and the average time was a minute and three seconds. And uh, it says there was 2,000.1K sessions, so the same person came back a few times, looked, thought, left, came back, thought. Yep. Ooh, traffic channel. It's the highest one. Direct. Again, with the direct. Mm. Yeah. So I'll just say one thing that I think I will do from now on is I'm going to make a bit.ly link or something like that for things. I didn't, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So when I send to friends and family, they'll have their own bit.ly link. And when I put it on maybe Instagram, I'll have one. And when I put it just so that I can just be very much aware of where people are coming from. So it does say direct is 150, social 21, organic search four. Oh, that's still the last seven days. Sorry. 90 days. Okay. Yeah. And does it have percentages? Does it have percentages? I don't know. Acquisition report. I'm afraid to open a new tab and make it go away. Okay. Here we go. Direct 78%. Mm. That's 1,000.252 users. And then social was 20%. And then organic and referral were tiny, tiny little slivers. So that's very interesting. So do you think that 78%, do you think of your marketing, 78% was direct to people? Yeah, like anytime I pasted a link, I would just pasted my Kickstarter link. I didn't make it a, a, you know, a tiny URL or anything like that. So I guess that I am correct in that most of the backers were from me sharing to friends and family. It must be, it must be. I don't know. Or well, Instagram followers or Twitter followers, you did a few of those. Yeah, um, that's true. I don't know. I will write the Kickstarter help and, and, and ask if they have more info on that one. 
So here's just some other random things. So I have 152 project followers, people who just followed the project and like to get notified when it was ending. And that's why there's often a big rush at the end because Kickstarter will send an email to your backers or to your followers saying, it's ending. Do you want to still back? They did to me. There you go. Out of 152 project followers, I had 45 converted. So it's a 29% conversion rate. I have no idea if that's good or not. I would say that's great. I would be very interested to know what happened to the other 110 <laughs> or whatever it is, um, the other 70%, 71%. Is there any way to message those people that follow the project? Hmm, I don't know. That's a good question. Hey, how's it going? Why didn't you like my project? <laughs> well, interestingly, or like, would you like to find out about the next project? Hmm. What else are you interested in? I wonder if there's a way to roll them forwards because they've expressed interest. It might not be in the right timing this time, but who knows in the future? Yeah, that's a good point. Ooh, let's think about that one. Mm. Yeah, that seems like something I should write down. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the top three things you've learned from the marketing side, from these numbers, from what you've done? What have you learned? What's the big thing you've got on marketing? Oh, definitely contact people one-on-one. -on -one. Even the old friends, like absolutely contacting old friends. And we did, you know, just ask them, hey, how's it going? And then they were like, it's going great. Here's my life. And then they ask how you're going and you share the Kickstarter. This 100% got me sales. Like there's there's no question. Like they said they would back it and then they did. <laughs> like there's, you, know, <laughs> you don't need a Google Analytics to tell you that. <laughs> like I can see their name. So I think that, yeah, don't discount your friends and family. Like the people who love and support you are going to support you first. And then don't be scared to contact people you don't know if they, like, I guess you call it like a warm lead. Like I'm not randomly contacting people that aren't following me on, that's like, there's no reason to do that. But people who are already following me on social media, I sent a lot of private messages and yeah, people 100% backed or shared. There's one woman who didn't back, but she, she shares, I could see her retweeting all of my tweets and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like that's just as special to me. Like I know it's like, it takes a button click, but if you're retweeting my stuff, it means you're following me and engaging with me and, and it really helps. And I, I think I, I told you like, because I contact every backer, I had already had this story that I contacted that, you know, big indie comic mm. publisher, well, a publisher, his, his own publishing house, but he retweeted me, you know, he, and he retweeted me even at the end. And I swear to God, every time he retweeted me, I got a a pledge it just it coincided so perfectly it had to have been from that and oh i didn't even talk about it so we had come up with some ideas you know in our last one so there was we come up with a few and i said i would do these things and one of them was like trying to get featured in like horror media like maybe online mm. horror magazines and we didn't do uh, we said no we won't do that because i i said oh yeah like when you do kind of outreach to bigger websites, you have to, what I've read is you don't just cold call them. I mean, you can, some of them do that, but you want to start building a relationship with them early on, slowly build a relationship so that, so that when it is a project of yours, you can pitch it and you're not just some person out of the blue. And I'm like, okay. So I start looking up horror websites that I could pitch to. And I'm like, wait a minute, I am friends with a horror website publisher. <laughs> 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 but because like, I don't know, when someone is your friend, you, it sounds so lame, but you kind of forget, you know, that they're actually doing the thing they do. So a couple of years ago, the whole Women in Horror Month thing, this one website called Morbidly Beautiful had a hashtag and I participated and they really like my work. And then at the beginning of the year, they were looking to commission someone for a logo for their podcast. They couldn't afford me. They really, really like my work. They were really excited that I like pitched to them, but they couldn't afford me. And I said, no problem. I said, I'd love to work with you on this. Let me know what your price is. But you know, in the end, they went with someone else. And I made sure to subscribe to their podcast, write them about their podcast, just to let them know like there's really no hard feelings. Like I'm listening to your podcast anyway, like a cool logo, like it's good choice. You know, I just wanted so I, and it wasn't just that moment. Like I've had a relationship with them online, you know, for a couple of years now, just on and off. And I had written them at the beginning of my Kickstarter, just letting them know and they were very excited, but I didn't ask them to feature me. I just shared it with the editor and she was very excited personally. And then I thought, you know what? I wonder if they ever promote Kickstarter. So I searched on the website and they have this thing called Fund It Friday and they haven't done many in like three. And so I write the editor and I'm like, hey, you know, uh, you do Fund It Friday. I'm, my Kickstarter is ending in a week. You know, how can I get featured? And she's like, oh, definitely, definitely. 
So I wrote, did a write up, you know, myself, and then she took it and added to it. And I was featured on this fucking horror website. And, you know, it's not the biggest horror website in the world, but it's my target audience or like what I thought the, the like spooky girls, you know, so it's absolutely the target audience that I wanted. Now I notice my target audience is more men, but I think it's still, I'll say my target audience is like cool guys who are kind of a kind of a feminist slant to their thinking, you know, but, and are also into spooky things. I think that's like my target audience after this Kickstarter, that seems to be what it is. So I thought that was amazing. It really warmed my little heart to like, see that I was featured on this website. You know, it was really cool. And it was from building a relationship years ago. I think that's incredible. And you remembered, you took action. And one of the things I think you did really well is you basically wrote the article for them. And I think that is so important. People who are running websites, magazines, articles, like they are super busy trying to produce content. And if someone comes forward and says, here, I've got this great idea. It'd be cool for your readers. I've written it. It's got great images. I've done everything for you. All you need to do is like top and tail it. It's literally um, what I did. People will love you for it. They will love you for it. So I think that's incredible that you did that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's literally what I did. <laughs> and I even wrote it in the third person. And then I put a quote <laughs> from me to myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love the little quotes. Yeah, I write my own quotes sometimes. <laughs> and I, I do feel weird. It's like Alan Donegan said this. And I'm, uh, like, I'm literally just saying it. It's not a lie. <laughs> it's not a lie. It's true. So look, there's some learning from marketing, which is incredibly important. Let's shift gear a little bit because there's something here. Like I've said many times to people that in business, you don't actually get to do what you love until you've sold it. Once you've sold it, then the work begins because now you've got to deliver it. You've got to do what you actually like. And you sold it. You sold it. Now it's time to deliver it. So you get the fun bit of drawing, creating, writing, finishing the story, doing all the nice bits, working on it. I guess phase two now is producing, delivering, and making sure that people are happy. And then we can sort of work out what to do next. So how are you feeling about the next phase? Because we're shifting from marketing to production. I'm so happy. I'm like super excited. (laughs) But I remember you saying like, you know, the reason people say that there's like feast and famine in business is because they, they make and then they market and then they make and then they market and that you have to market the whole time. So I'm trying to think about how to continue marketing. I don't think it pays to do the one-on-one right now because it would just, that literally, that would take like an hour a day, you know, and I need to put that time since I have a full-time job and uh, everything. I need to put that time into making the comic. But what's exciting is as I create that's marketing content right there, I'm going to be writing the backers updates. I'll only get their emails when I send them the backer survey. So the backer survey gets their address and everything. And it's way too early to to send out the backer survey because some of them might move in like three months. So I wrote, I did my update today. I did a little video of myself and I planned out the, the next steps for everybody. So like April, I'll be doing the inks and pencils. May is the colors. And it's probably, I think the inks and pencils are going to bleed into May and May. I only need two weeks to do the colors. It's very fast. Then in June will be printing, send it to the printer, getting it back. And in the meantime, I'll be doing like one of the, some of the stretch goals, like the digital production journal and, and making sure the prints are done. Everything's printed and then it's another backer report. So I can start shipping stuff off uh, in June. Anyways, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to check now, but everything I want to be shipping in July so that people get it for August or if they're international, it'll be more like September. And I also have a lot of commissions I have to do. So I have to start scheduling those commissions in. And I also have commissions that are unrelated to the Kickstarter, which are coming in. So my life is very exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's super exciting. It's super exciting. Yeah, creatively, like so much going on right now. So you've called it. You said about the thing that, you know, small businesses feast or famine, and that's normally due to the fact your marketing or sales is one's marketing or sales is feast or famine. My question for you, Jamie, is what could you do? Going back to the 1,000 true fans from Kevin Kelly, what could you do maybe one thing a week that would drive your marketing list, your email list? Because I think... 
if you can keep developing that email list, if you can convert as many of the 172 backers as you can to your email list, if you could convert some of the 100 odd project followers that didn't follow you to your email list, if you could get some of your social media to your email list, if we can start to build that, if we can get your email list to 250 by the time you've produced your next version, 250 new people, if we can get that done by the time you produce this version, if you've enjoyed it and want to do another version, you've got a ready-made audience to explode the next version. But if we don't do any of that work and you do all the production with nothing and you get to September and go, okay, I'm ready to do my next one, it's like we're starting from cold again. So the question is, what could you do? Maybe it's a list of things. You just do one each week just so that it keeps going. What could you do each week? So the email list is something that I've always wanted to have. I keep putting off. I had one for a while with my erotic art and then I let it die. And, you know, as you say, like you have to keep your email list going or people just don't give a shit when you write them. So as I just said, like, okay, when you send the backer survey, you can ask people if they want to be added to your mailing list. But I realized, no, I don't have to wait for that because I have backer updates that I'm going to be sending. So in the next backer update, I can say, by the way, you know, I'll be sending updates, but if you'd like to be aware of everything I'm doing, that's not just related to Mandy nine, you know, join my mailing list. So I can ask them directly. And like, I'm trying to think, cause when you have a, an email list as an artist, usually you give them something, you know, so I'm not a e marketer, so I don't have a course to give people. Usually you give like a comic and I don't want to give my erotic comic again for this because it's, it's a different audience. So I don't know, maybe I can make a coloring page or something. I need some sort of lead magnet. I know what you're saying about lead magnets. I would just chill on that. Like these people love you. It's enough to say, join my list. I'll keep you updated with my art, my next comic book ideas. It's enough to say that and then to do something every now and again, like saying, okay, I've got three ideas for my comic too. Which one would you vote for and have some audience engagement, some fun, some different bits, share them one picture of Mandy Nine every now and again and some different pieces. Like there's enough to do that. I think quite often people want the like, okay, I'm gonna have my lead magnet, which is a 10 week course on how to draw or whatever it is, and you sign up, put your email address in and da da da. Like it doesn't need to be that. We just need a simple first version that says, like what I'm doing, follow me be part of it. I've got some cool stuff to share. That's enough for now. And then building up those people. And if you start now and we build up five, 10 a week, by the time you get to September, you'll have your 250 and then we'll be ready to do the next comic or whatever it is you want to go to next. Yeah, that sounds great. Because I was, I was thinking of like people who aren't one of the Kickstarter fans, but yeah, you're right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just start by getting the list up. You know, I even have like my mailer light free account. I just have, you know, haven't added anything to it. And I do like, I actually find the newsletter fun when I had it before because doing the backer updates is exactly a newsletter. And it's so fun. It's so fun to write fun stories, get people engaged, talk back and forth with people. Like I actually enjoy it. So I don't see that as being a chore at all, at all, at all. It's actually very exciting to me. So yeah, if we say my marketing now is to build my list and each week find a new way to sort of do that, I'm really happy with that. Perfect. So my follow-up question, which you probably know is coming, is how do we make sure this happens once a week, that something happens once a week to build that list? How are we going to make sure that happens? How do we make sure? Do you mean like I have to send you a a WhatsApp saying I did something or do I actually like what actionable step can I do? Like are you talking about accountability or actionable steps right now? Uh, Accountability, because you can make it up each week based on what's exciting, what you want to do, what you fancy, like, oh, I haven't written to them, I'll do this. Or actually, I want to post on my social media to get people to it. Or, you know, I'll go old school for one day and do an hour of individual messages. Whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is each week. Yeah, it's the accountability of how, because I have a feeling you're going to get distracted with doing the actual drawing because that's what you love. And 95% of your time should absolutely be that. I just want to make sure that the 5%, 10% marketing each week doesn't slip because it is important. It, if we're aiming to build this as a an actual thing in the future, we cannot let go of marketing. We have to still do the groundwork going forwards. But you know, 10%, 5%, doesn't matter. So I now work out four days a week instead of six because I'm trying this heavier workout where I lift heavier but do less reps. This is relevant. 
Um, so <laughs> I'm not just showing off. <laughs> because of that, Wednesday is just a walking day and it's not a workout day, which means the time that I could have worked out, I could schedule to this. I could put an hour when I would be walking to the gym, I will put an hour to marketing before I do my big walk for the day. So I could actually like that space has been carved out, you know, in my schedule where it wasn't there before. I love it. So we could call it mailing list Wednesday. Yeah, let's do it. Mailing list Wednesday. Mailing list Wednesday. Build that list, baby. Perfect. I'm even writing build that list, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's so important. It's yeah. so important because the next time we come to the project, if you do this, you will have a list of people to start with and we won't be scratching around going, okay, we need to individually message a bunch of people we've not spoken to for ages. We'll have a bunch of people that we've already got connections with warm. Like it's going to be, it's so much easier the second time, Jamie. It's so much easier. Then the third time gets easier and the fourth time gets easier. And by the sixth time, you're like, why was this even difficult at the beginning? Uh, and you have to remember how much hard work it was at the start. So I feel like we're in a great place. I feel like you've got a clear production plan. You've got keep the marketing bubbling away to keep it going. You look happy. I guess my final question for the episode is, how are you going to celebrate your sales success? Well, that's a very good question. I did buy myself some nail polish. <laughs> that was my big thing. I bought two bottles of $10 nail polish a blue and a purple. And I'm wearing them both because I am a grown woman who likes to paint her nails different colors. So that was like my one thing. <laughs> I'm not good at like celebrating myself, to be perfectly honest, in uh, this uh, dimension. I don't know where people are in the future, but it's Easter weekend. So I think that like, I'm going to make a very nice meal and have, yeah, just a really nice Easter with some chocolate. I do love the Cadbury cream eggs. It's my childhood love. Oh. So I think I'll get myself some of those and just a lovely coffee and you know maybe read a comic while i eat the cadbury cream eggs and the coffee oh no i quit coffee decaf decaf <laughs> a herbal tea mm, i like decaf coffee i'm allowing myself that come on girls gotta have some vices because <laughs> <laughs> i know that's one thing i'm historically not good at is celebrating and taking a moment to appreciate how far you've come. And I do feel we've done that on this episode. So let's just take a moment right now to appreciate and for everyone listening, do this yourself, like take a moment to appreciate how far you have come to get where you are. It's unbelievable. And maybe Andrew, the editor, please could you put in some cheering noise in the background? <laughs> and Jamie's smiling. And I think we should all be smiling because like, we start so many projects and to push one over the line is unbelievable. And congratulations, Jamie. This has been amazing. I can't believe that this happened to be perfectly honest. This is amazing. Thank you so much, Alan. Like this is incredible. I'm so happy. Thank you so much. I'm glad to have been along on the ride. I really am. And we're going to stay tracking this. I want to know what happens next and anything that happens. My closing thoughts for you listening to this podcast are actually to pick up on what Jamie said at the start of the podcast, which was commit to one idea. It doesn't matter what it is. And I think so many times people come on our courses and they're paralyzed by how do I know which idea will be best? And there's only one answer to that. You don't <laughs> and you won't until you do it. And I don't know either. So we've just got to pick one. We've just got to make it happen. And I love Jamie's comment. If you're going to just commit to one idea, it might as well be one you like. And I keep repeating to people, why would you ever build a business that you don't enjoy? I don't get it. It's out of some kind of false sense of, I feel like I should do this because this will make other people happy. So I will stop trying to make other people happy and focus on what makes you happy for a bit and then work on it. Get it out there. Pick one idea. Pick it one that excites you. Pick one that you think will go well and just do it. It doesn't really matter. Just make it happen. And in 13 episodes, Jamie has gone from, I don't know what to do with my art to I've got a fully funded Kickstarter of 223% with 172 backers. And her first comic book is being produced. It'll be printed. I can't wait to have a picture of you holding that comic book. That's blatantly going to be one of the images for the podcast. Just do it because you will never get to that level of success unless you commit, start 
and take action. Good luck, go make it happen, and let me know how it goes. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.